that the sensor will sense as it goes over the Earth. Um, so a very low resolution at the bottom, for example, like the meteor sat satellites, uh, they can cover the whole Earth um, every 15 to 30 minutes. So their swath is very, very, it's 80,000 kilometers, which is very, very wide, and will give us very little information. It can tell us cloud coverage, it can tell us uh, some movements in weather, but it won't be able to tell us specific information about the geological composition of the Earth, for example, or very little at least. Um, and as we move up, we'll get to a uh, much more high resolution, specific, smaller plot areas, smaller pixel dimensions, one to four meters, for example, with the pumps. Uh, and it takes us about a few years to cover the Earth each time. So again, the idea behind remote sensing is we can get to those plots of land that are hard to get to at a very regular basis, instead of us being out there in the field sensing ourselves with our remotely with our sensors by hand or by going out and collecting samples of plants and analyzing them in the lab um, for degradation. So what do we get from that? What, do, what does the sensor give us? And really every sample size, every pixel, when, when the pulse gets back to the um, sensor, we basically get a number which is then being able to convert using models into different graphs. And that will lead us to higher and lower spectral resolution. I'll just show the next graph a little bit. That is being high resolution, this is being low resolution. Um, where a lower resolution for every wavelength of the electromagnetic wave that, that is sensed, um, you get a certain band. So every area in the red at the bottom shows you the coverage of every part of the sensor. And it gives you one value for the blue lights, one value for the green lights, for the red lights, and so on and so forth. But it doesn't give you a very consecutive uh, path that will be easy to analyze from that. So this would be a low resolution um, from Landsat uh, satellite for this matter. Um, on a high resolution in this other direction would be um, a sensor that will sense every 10 uh, micrometers of, oh, nanometers, sorry, from a wavelength and we'll give you a value for each one of them. So you can basically generate a very consecutive graph which will be able to tell us if this chemical reacts at a certain wavelength, what can I, I can tell from this graph how much of this uh, chemical do I have in the soil, for example, or in the plants, and like, and I'll show examples of that. But for example, if you have, in this graph here, you've got the um, dolomite, for example. Uh, you can see there's a dip in that area of, of 2200 uh, nanometers, and therefore, in this area, we can say, okay, if we have this dip in this area of the, of the curve, we probably have dolomite. So, what was I looking at here, and that's what the remainder of the talk will be focusing on, is determining the tools for analysis of degradation. And I've been doing a lot of literature search, basically, and trying to find what people have been using to determine whether uh, how degradation is happening or what's happening with integrated areas uh, along a period of time. So I was looking at aerial photography at salinity soil property specific bands, uh, especially on the French research on uh, that part. Uh, specific reflectance characteristics of soils, for example, if a soil has um, different composition chunks, has higher, it's, it's more crusty, less crusty, uh, more silt, less silt, uh, uh, higher levels of clay, lower level levels of clay, it all react differently. We'll be able to look at that just a bit. And then productivity, especially through uh, normalized uh, differentiation, of course, I always forget the exact meaning of it, but normalized uh, difference vegetation index. And that's the NDVI, which I will talk about just a little bit so I can show you the way it works as well. So, repeating the aerial photography, the idea here is if you take a plane, fly it over and take a photograph of an area, and you repeat that in consecutive time. So you go, for example, one year, four years later, 10 years later, and 20 years later, you can actually overlay those photos and say, how did this plot of land change over time? So this method here, this is by chance a lagoon, not really a uh, degraded area of land that can find a good photo for that. But um, you could change, see how uh, vegetation patterns change over time. For example, how much, um, trees came into an area for wood encroachment, for example, uh, versus what was once 
mostly grasslands. So you'll be able to see those changes in aerial photographs. In soil characteristics, again here this is soil plus from an arid area where it's really dried up. So you got soil crusting. And this is out of a research by Michael Nicholson and Zink, published about four papers uh, dealing with soil crusts. And it shows here at the interval between 450 and 800 uh, nanometers, the graphs for different types of soils and as they will be shown. For example, we have a puffy crust, a salty crust, and a down to a cloud field. And you can really see that the, the amount of reflectance, which is basically the ratio of amount of light coming in to Earth and the amount of light coming out as sensed by the sensor. So how much we get there, it's only a proportion, therefore it has no unit. Um, how much of this reflectance comes back to the sensor, how big difference you have between 50% uh, reflectance to 20% reflectance uh, for that between the cloud field and a cloud crust. So the more a soil will be degraded, usually we'll find crusts and especially salty crusts happening in those areas. So again, a way of seeing this is a good understanding of if we have more crusts and consensus from space, we can value that this area is degrading. Um, this here is out of the um, no paper uh, using a spot satellite, which is a French researcher. Um, I put the data in, which is in the band under uh, the SO4 minus, the uh, sulfate. This does not make any sense, and I left it there because I wanted to be accurate to the text, though I know that it's probably a mistake in the text or a misprint. So I translated it in that way as well, um, even though that's probably wrong, and it even say it's a very weak absorption, so ver therefore it's not a very good um, tool for that specific uh, for salt phase, for that specific um, But generally, again, we have different ions here and how they can be sensed, on what bands can they be sensed uh, using satellites. And the spot, again, is high uh, uh, resolution um, sensing. When we get to the um, Averis, which is I always, it's the airborne visible infrared imaging spectrometer, again high resolution. They went in to look into potential productivity, and for that they were using um, photosynthetic vegetation versus non-photosynthetic vegetation versus open soil. So it's easily, very easily sensed using the NTBI model index, which I will show in the uh, in a few slides. Um, but basically, we can we can determine from space according to these graphs, what, what, photo, what area has more, mostly photosynthetic vegetation and which area has non-photosynthetic vegetation. And of course, bare soil is very easy to recognize as opposed to them uh, because it has very low productivity. And basically, the higher uh, non-photosynthetic vegetation we have is a good early sign for degradation of land. Therefore, the more non-photosynthetic vegetation usually will lead to uh, bare soil later on. So in arid landscapes, that is. Um, this shows us again here, through this research here by Asna, um, how, what, what a big difference there is between uh, under canopy and bare soil in soil carbon, which is very, very important. Um, basically showing us the big difference between uh, bare soil and under canopy soil for uh, carbon, soil carbon, which is very important for the um, plants to be able to grow there. So, and again, from the same paper, uh, they showed us the photosynthetic versus non photosynthetic cover and how you can use um, this information to estimate uh, soil organic car carbon um, to a 0.92 R squared value, which is very high. Uh, so, it sh really shows us how we can use these methods to be able to predict the changes in carbon and therefore. One of, the, one of the indicators of degradation. So again, this leads us back to the NDBI, which basically, <coughs> what it takes, normalizes, well, that doesn't come up very well on this big screen there, but it normalizes for the near infrared minus the red bands to the total of that area. And that does, normalizes for uh, atmospheric noise, basically in the sensors, um, as well as will be able to tell us is this land, is this uh, plant vegetation giving us, emitting a healthy amount of infrared um, 
radiation versus red or not. And the higher amount of, of infrared radiation coming back, the healthier the vegetation. So we can from that estimate also how the vegetation is doing at different stages of its time. And again, here's a graph that shows over a period of a year, a cycle using NDVI, and it shows us the beginning of the cycle towards the end of the cycle of growing period. So that's what that will be for a crop. If you, if you look at it, at A, that's, that's when the growing season starts, the, product, the productivity of the vegetation grows towards the peak at around 60, and then drops again towards 70. If you take multiple of these graphs year after year, and we see a decline in the peak productivity, we can assume that this line is becoming more and more graded. And again, here is a nice image to show degradation here. That's the effectiveness of conservation. So basically, the area that's much greener is the area that's being conserved right now versus the area that's more grazing on the other side. And you can see the red dots in there are basically um, all these areas here. They're basically shrubs and trees. So you can see the shrub encroachment happening on the same type of area uh, between the conservation plots and the non-conservative area. Again, that's a very clear indicator of the improvement. So here are some of my sources.
can also understand practices probably on how, how we can, uh, looking at, at lands that are being managed a certain way versus another way, which of them is degrading faster and try to use the slower degradation process, for example. Okay. Any other questions? No? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.